Hey everyone, let's dive into why understanding trade policies is a must for global investors. Trade policies shape trade volume, value, and ultimately your return on investment. Keeping an eye on potential government trade policy changes is key since these shifts can alter product demand, pricing, and impact firm profitability and growth. First up, let's talk about the benefits of international trade. By trading, countries can obtain goods and services that they don't produce efficiently themselves. Trade can stimulate economic growth by providing access to larger markets for capital and products. Increased competition from international markets forces companies to become more efficient. Countries can specialize in producing goods where they have a comparative advantage. Trade facilitates the flow of financial capital, enhancing global productivity. However, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. There are some downsides too. Trade can increase income inequality as some sectors thrive while others decline. And then there are job losses. Industries that can't compete with imports may see job losses. Now let's talk about trade restrictions and agreements. We'll focus on tariffs, quotas, and export subsidies. These are basically the tools governments use to control how much domestic households and companies can trade with other countries. So let's break it down. First up, tariffs. Tariffs are just taxes slapped on imports. Then we have import quotas, which are limits on the number of goods that can be imported. Think of it as a cap on imports for a certain time. Next, we've got Voluntary Export Restraints, abbreviated as VERS. Here, the exporting country agrees to limit the quantity of goods they send over to their trading partner. It's like saying, we'll only send you X amount of this stuff. Export subsidies are another one. This is where the government gives money or tax breaks to domestic companies to help them sell their goods abroad. An embargo is a total ban on trading specific goods. And lastly, domestic content requirements mandate that a certain percentage of a product must be made locally. Governments have a bunch of reasons for imposing these restrictions. They might want to protect local industries from foreign competition or help new industries get on their feet. Sometimes it's about creating jobs, protecting national security, or simply making money from tariffs. Other times, it's about retaliating against trade restrictions from other countries. There are also capital restrictions, which limit the ability of foreigners to own domestic assets and vice versa. Trade restrictions affect the flow of goods, while capital restrictions deal with financial assets. Let's dig deeper. Tariffs are taxes on imports. They aim to protect local industries and reduce trade deficits but they also make imported goods pricier, which reduces demand for them and can lower global welfare. For small countries, those that can't influence global prices, tariffs generally result in net welfare losses. However, for large countries, big importers that can influence prices, tariffs can sometimes lead to net gains, but only if they don't face retaliation and the benefits outweigh the losses. Quotas limit how much of a good can be imported. They usually make foreign producers raise their prices because they can't supply as much. This leads to what we call quota rents, which are extra profits for those holding import licenses. Quotas can result in more welfare loss than tariffs unless the government captures the quota rents. With tariffs, the government collects the extra money, but with quotas, it's the license holders who benefit. Voluntary export restraints are similar to quotas, but imposed by exporters. They typically cause more harm to the importing country than quotas do. Export subsidies are meant to boost exports. However, they can mess with the natural flow of trade and production, reducing overall welfare. Sometimes, importing countries fight back with countervailing duties, which are extra tariffs on subsidized goods. For small countries, export subsidies raise domestic prices and hurt welfare. For large countries, subsidies can lower global prices 
and transfer some benefits abroad, making the welfare hit even worse. Let's sum it up. Tariffs and import quotas decrease national welfare in small countries but might increase it in large ones. Export subsidies and VRs generally reduce welfare. All right, class, now let's talk about the world of trading blocks and regional integration. Imagine a group of countries teaming up to boost their trade by cutting out tariffs and quotas amongst themselves, but still having the power to set their own rules for non-members. These arrangements between countries aim to facilitate trade and economic cooperation. Let's get into some key examples and types. So we've got a couple of big players here. North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. Think of it as the trade trio of the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. European Union, this one's a bit more complex. With a bunch of European countries banding together, there are four types of regional trading blocks. Free Trade Area FTA. In an FTA, member countries agree to eliminate tariffs, quotas, and other trade barriers among themselves while maintaining their own trade policies with non-members. Picture a free trade club where members trade freely among themselves but still set their own rules for outsiders. NAFTA, now USMCA, is a classic example with the US, Canada, and Mexico in the club. Customs Union. A customs union goes a step further than an FTA by adopting a common external trade policy toward non-members. This is like an FTA on steroids. Members trade freely among themselves and also share a common external trade policy. Remember the Benelux countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. The European Union started as a customs union where member countries have a common set of tariffs and trade rules for countries outside the union. Common market. Now, this includes all the perks of a customs union plus the freedom to move labor and other production factors among members. This type of block allows for the free movement of goods, services, capital, and labor among member countries. One classic example is Mercosur. That includes Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. An economic union includes a common market and extends further by coordinating economic policies among member countries. This type combines everything a common market offers and adds coordinated economic policies and institutions. The European Union is the poster child here. European Union is also an economic union with common institutions and policies that guide economic governance. Monetary Union. When an economic union goes a step further and adopts a common currency, it becomes a monetary union. In a monetary union, member countries adopt a single currency and coordinate their monetary policies. Again, the Eurozone, where multiple European countries use the Euro, is an example of a monetary union. Think of the WTO as the Global Trade Referee aiming to knock down trade barriers and settle disputes between countries, treating all on a most favored nation basis. Compared to WTO negotiations, regional integration is often quicker and less politically messy. It gives preferential treatment to members, which can shift trade patterns and create new dynamics. Trade creation occurs when integration replaces costly domestic production with cheaper imports from member countries. It boosts welfare. Imagine country A and B in a trading block where B produces goods more cheaply than C, a non-member. After removing tariffs, A imports more from B, increasing consumer surplus and overall welfare. For example, when Spain joined the European Union, it started importing cheaper agricultural products from other Eurozone countries, benefiting Spanish consumers. Trade diversion happens when integration swaps low-cost imports from non-members with higher-cost ones from member countries, reducing welfare. Using the same countries if C is cheaper, but A switches to B after joining the bloc, Consumer surplus increases, but overall welfare might suffer if trade diversion outweighs trade creation. Trading blocks can lead to more efficient trade, 
lower prices for consumers, stronger currencies, and even political stability and peace. For instance, the European Union has contributed to peace and stability in Europe by fostering economic interdependence. However, there are also drawbacks. Job losses can occur in industries that cannot compete with increased competition. Reduced competition within the bloc can lead to inefficiencies, and economic problems in one member country can spread to others, as seen in the Eurozone debt crisis. Cultural clashes and the loss of policy independence can also be significant challenges. Countries may struggle to balance their own economic needs with the demands of the bloc. For example, the UK's decision to leave the European Union, Brexit, was partly driven by a desire to regain control over national policies. That's it for today. We've covered a lot about trading blocks and regional integration. Keep practicing and exploring these topics as they play a pivotal role in international economics. See you next time and happy studying.